I'm going to start from the very beginning. And we're going to talk about how the camera sees differently than our eye does. Because this is where it all starts, with the camera. So the eye doesn't see an actual representation of the scene. OK? The eye, the eye interprets the scene with the help of the mind. OK? So the mind will add emotion, beauty, story, context. Um, and it concentrates what is important to the scene. I have to do something for a second so I can see my screen better. And so emotion, beauty, story, and context are added by the mind, as well as the concentration, what is important in the scene. Okay. Um, evolution uses the eye to see in a way that helps keeps us alive and more likely to reproduce successfully, not necessarily to see the real world. Now, the camera sees exactly what is in the scene. Have you noticed sometimes you take a, a picture and then you take it into post processing and you say, this isn't the picture that I took because the camera is seeing the scene literally where your eye is adding a whole lot to it. Okay. Um, you're instead of seeing per precepts, you're seeing concepts, you're putting things together, you're adding your emotions, you're uh, putting a story to the scene. Um, you're concentrating on what's important to the scene. You're looking at part of the scene where the camera just sees literally what is there. The camera, as I said, the camera puts a frame around part of the scene. When you're looking at a scene with your eye, there's no frame. There's a peripheral vision, but you're, you're not seeing it in any way that the camera is seeing it. The camera has less dynamic range than the eye and is otherwise less sophisticated in its technical, technical abilities. So when you're taking a picture, let me go to the next. It's up to you, the photographer, artist, to add the elements necessary to what the camera sees to make it more like what the eye sees. We have to add in feeling, context, beauty, or, or ugliness and story by creating a specific composition and choosing how we use light in the rules of composition to create our unique viewpoint, our masterpiece. The way in which we do this helps form our style. So st style starts at the very, very beginning. Um, I have a quote here from a Brian Rivera. I think he's a nature photographer. This quote was um, made specifically for my course, The Art of Photography. And so I'm going to substitute a word. So I'm going to say, so an original style must go beyond the literal representation of the scene or subject. The literal representation is the way the camera sees it without us doing something to that camera to add what our eye does. To go back to the quote, it must deeply express the feelings and vision of the photographer and clearly reveal that it was created by an artist and not by just the camera. It must be clear that it involved an original, deliberate creation and that every aspect of making the photograph in the field and in the photographer's post-processing digital studio, including the printing, are an individual expression from, when the, from within the artist. So I think this quote kind of summarize, summarizes what um, I said before. Now, this is the way the camera sees the scene. This, is, this would be a picture from, let's say, a beginning photographer who is not adding any of these extra elements that the camera sees. It's not a very interesting picture. This one's better. The 
photography. It's not a great picture, but the photographer is sharing her personal vision here. She's putting something into it. There's some elements of comp uh, composition here, some light and shadow. It's a little more interesting. So how do we see photo uh, photographically? You should, and I, again, um, let's start before we take the picture. You should realize that there are an infinite number of photographs you can take from where you are now. How then do we aim the camera to that particular frame to photograph? How do we find something that might be interesting? Well, seeing is our ability to absorb what lies in our view, process that, and target the frame that is the most compelling. That is the analytical part. So the, ca the camera does see a particular frame and we have, to, we have to aim that camera for there to be the frame that we want people to see. The eye doesn't usually do that. The eye sees the whole, the whole scene. So we have to work with what the camera does. There are many things in front of you now, but you are not necessarily aware of all of them. But should you always look at the same or similar things that you photograph and not see many more worthy of your seeing? As you go through your daily activities, drive from home to your destination, take a walk in the neighborhood, do a little gardening, and so on. You notice things that delight you. That may be the twist on the stem of a leaf that is different from the others, the lineup of cars and traffic in a particular way the birds on the power lines, like the notes on the staff lines, that may suddenly enter your consciousness. You see them. This is a quote from a photographer. So, as this gentleman said, style starts with what you choose to photograph. Well, let's start at the beginning of the day. When you get up and you're in your bedroom, Hey, how about this? Look at your sheets. Do you normally notice this? This is a mundane, uh, mundane scene that you see every day. Um, yet, there may be some photographic interest to this with the, the shape, the play of light, the pattern. So, style starts with the very beginning of the process. What is it that you see? that you don't normally, maybe that you normally don't even notice that may have interest. How about this? Would you really notice that little piece of paper or cardboard, whatever it is in this scene? Might this be of interest? This is a photograph by the gentleman who made the quote. Style involves original ideas. Maybe it's simple, but the way that glove is shaped and folded over, I mean, what does that mean to you? Could that be interesting? How about a simple scene like this one? What can you read into this? What factors of style go into uh, photographing this? What are you thinking of? Is it interesting? Here's a simple scene, not much there, just a, a chair, but look at the play of light. Look at the parallel lines. Every decision that went into making this simple photograph probably has something to do with style. They're all choices we make when we decide to take a photograph. Um, Lin Yu Tang was an early 20th century Chinese philosopher, novelist, social commentator. Um, I think he got into a little bit of a trouble. Um, but he said, people don't travel anymore. They false travel. I think you all can relate to this. They travel to improve their minds or to collect memories 
or pictures to impress their friends when they come back. Tourists are so busy with cameras that they have no time to look at the places themselves. He says that the true type of travel is to get lost and unknown. He tells the story of an American woman taken by Chinese friends up a misty mountain. There is so much mist, nothing can be seen, and yet her friends make her climb ever higher. When they get to the peak, the only thing they can make out is the outline of distant hills barely visible on the horizon. The American woman protests, but there's nothing to see here. And her Chinese friends reply, that's exactly the point. We came up here to see nothing. In Lin's view, you must possess the capacity to open yourself to seeing what's in front of and around you all the time, not just when you are on a special trip. He gives us a sizable translation from a Chinese philosopher who expands on this, explaining that seeing the beauty and grace in the most majestic mountains means nothing if you can't see beauty and grace in a little patch of water, a village, a bridge, a tree, a hedge, or a dog. Do you see a theme here? I think our previous uh, photographer who is, who, who um, I quoted from, also talked about seeing the simple, the things that we don't normally don't notice that may have some uh, good reason to photograph. This was taken from Lin Yutang's um, uh, book, The Importance of Living. It's a very interesting book if you can get a hold of a copy. He makes a lot of commentary. I think he comes to America and compares Chinese life to American life, and it's kind of uh, a, a bit humorous. Whoops, let's go back. Okay, secrets to becoming a really good photographer in less than a year. Now, these bullet points, I think are really, really important, especially for you people who haven't been doing photography for a long time. I've um, taken all these to heart and I've done them myself, but I think it's important to look at thousands and thousands of photographs and it's easy to do because we have the internet. Um, just look at a lot of photographs on different genres that appeal to you. Um, if they're well-known photographers or semi-well-known, see who's doing the pictures, follow them online. Um, see what you like, get a feel for what appeals to you. And then take thousands of pictures. I mean, literally thousands of them doesn't cost anything. We don't have to get the film developed anymore. And then out of all those thousands of pictures you've looked at, copy the photographers you like. Try to duplicate what they do. Do it again and again. Show your work to others. Post online. Invite criticism. And um, so you're going to get hurt a little bit. That's part of the process of learning. Other people can help you and they can tell you what's good about your pictures, what's not so good about your pictures. Um, after all, that's what we do at the, uh, at the Photography Club for River Arts every Thursday. We talk about our pictures and we talk about the pictures that other people have put up. Um, we help them make their pictures better. Um, sometimes we get a little bit of hurt. Sometimes we laugh, sometimes we cry. But that's part of the process of growing as a photographer. Um, try out different things. Try pictures in different genres. See what you like. See what you're good at. Important thing is take your camera everywhere. It's a famous saying, the, the best camera is the camera that you have with you. Um, it can be an instant camera. But if you have it, when the scene is there, you'll get a good picture. You're more likely to get a good picture. Learn how to use your camera, but don't become a high tech camera buff. Um, don't buy a whole lot of cameras and try to get the one with the most buttons. Um, you can get lost in the technical aspects. What's important is to learn how to take good pictures. Um, you, you take your time, 
there's a lot of free stuff online to learn the rules of composition and all about light and everything else that goes into taking a picture. This is all important. Learn about post-processing. Um, there's some simple programs out there that are free. Start on those. Eventually get some better ones as you progress as a photographer. Now I'm going to say two con contradictory things. One is go to where the pictures are. You know, go to where you can take great landscape pictures on vacation, with great scenes of mountains or water, or even uh, closer nearby, interesting architecture. But then don't just take the obvious pictures of those scenes. Walk around, take them from different angles, take them from different times of day. Take your time. We're not taking snapshots. We're not taking snapshots. We're trying to take interesting pictures. Now the contradictory part. Go into your backyard where there aren't obvious pictures and try to see anew. Now this is what I do a lot. Um, normally when you're looking out into a scene, let's say normally look from 10 to 20 feet ahead of us, if we're looking at 10 feet, or if we're looking at 20 feet, the scene looks pretty much the same wherever we are, it's just things are bigger or smaller. But if we go down to three feet or one foot or six inches, your backyard takes on a completely new dynamic. You're seeing in a different dimension. You're seeing things you've never seen before, small things, things from different angles. You're seeing a different play of shadow and light. It's a whole new world. So if you have your distance or double your distance, it's a different scene. There are literally an infinite amount of pictures in your backyard. So what I do and some of the others of us in our club do, especially now, is we go into our backyard and take pictures of nature, flower, bugs, butterflies, birds, and we do it every week, and there's different pictures every week. We get closer, we get further, we get up, we get down, we get different kinds of light, we get water droplets, we get all kinds of things going on. So a lot of us would agree with me that backyard pictures are just as interesting, and there's just as many there as there are going to uh, where the Taj Mahal is and taking pictures in India. Um, I am I'm known in my neighborhood um, as the snake because I will go in my neighbor's backyard with my camera and I'll be lying down and squirming around to try to get the best angles. And occasionally I will creep up into their picture window and they'll see my face and they'll get a little bit scared. But they'll say, oh, that's just Steve taking his pictures. So uh, they, uh, they just laugh. They don't mind. What I do is once a year, I give them a framed picture that keeps them happy. And uh, also join a photography club. That's where you'll get your good criticism. That's where you see other pe people's good pictures and you'll get new ideas. Um, it's, it's the fastest way to get good at photography. And then finally, specialize in one area of photography and be known for your work. Develop your style. Now I'm going to drill down into this a little bit. Um, most of us read or hear about a special technique or sub-genre of photography and possibly try it out. It could be something like focus stacking, infrared photography, collage, or digital art. Maybe we photograph just cats or find unusual subjects for macro or close-up photography. The problem is, is that we usually try it a few times and then go on to something else after we get a little bored. The key is to find something and to keep at it and have it become an obsession. At first, we might be copying what other experts do, something we find on a video on YouTube. But eventually, we will find a way to do it differently, a unique slant, and possibly become the go-to expert in our specialty. Then enter contests, set up a website, blog, make videos, use social media, 
Within a year, you might be the best on the planet at what you do. I really mean this. And I'm, I'm in the process of doing this myself. I've been taking, last summer I took uh, close-up pictures of butterflies in flight. People take birds in flight, but not a whole lot of people take close-ups of butterflies in flight. Well, there's a lot of technique to, to use, and you need a specialty camera to do it. But then there's a, a lot of art to it. So I've taken about 6,000, I would say, photographs of butterflies in flight, and I've gotten better at it. I've honed my technique, and, you know, when I was honing my technique, I wasn't even paying attention to how good the picture looked. I was just trying to get a picture in focus. But eventually, when I was able to do that, then I was starting to look at the background and, and the light and other things to take a more artistic picture. So um, I've entered contests. I'm in the process of setting up a website. I'm going to make a blog. I'm making videos right now. So. This is my specialty, and I don't think there's too many people in the world that are doing this right now. So maybe I could be really good at this and, and uh, you know, I don't expect to find, a, I don't expect to make a lot of money, but uh, maybe I'll become somewhat well known, not that that's important, but I'm having fun. Um, I've got a little bit on the rules of composition. That's not what this presentation is about, but I just want to keep you, keep, have you keep this in mind that composition is the way that elements are arranged in an image. Composition includes all the elements in a photo, not just the primary subject. The human eye tends to prefer images that have a certain sense of order, while it tends to reject images that are chaotic. That's the basic difference between good composition and poor composition. This is just an overall view about composition. Uh, here are some of the rules. These are just a few of them. Rules of third, I think you know that. Leaving space, filling the frame, leading lines, patterns, simplification, color, texture, symmetry, depth, framing, and there's more. Um, but what I want to do now is talk about um, different styles of photogra photography. I'm going to do it by showing different landscapes of photography, and I'm going to show it, do it by um, showing some of the photographers in our club and some other photographers. Here we have a landscape by Bob Miller. Um, does anybody want to comment? Do you see any elements of style here? What do you see? What is the what is the what did Bob do with his eye? What did he add to this picture by doing certain particular things with his camera to show a scene that is just not representational that the camera would see? He's added some things to it using some techniques in his camera to make this an interesting scene. Does anybody have yeah. any comments? He done. Here. Oh, he yeah. kept the horizon low so that it's the sky and the tree that are most prominent. And he uh, kept the tops of the grasses, I'll call them grasses, uh, relatively close to the horizon itself. So that there is a texture there instead of being uh, a subject. The subject uh, remains simple against a dramatic sky. So he uses, he uses, uh, minimal uh, space, a lot of open space. Um, I would say that's a rule, that's a compositional rule. Um, but see, what, from what I talked about before, you be, might be walking around in this scene and you wouldn't even notice this little dead tree, would you? But Bob noticed it and he said, there's something interesting about this. I think also the use of um, uh, a simple tonal color scheme here. Uh -huh. um, it, different shades of brown or whatever you want to call that color. A very simple scene, a very simple scene, and yet you want to look at I, it. Yes. I think also, also Steve, what you just said, the very monochromatic <laughs> color that he's used 
um, creates a mood to me. Exactly. So if Bob does this kind of thing over and over again, it's kind of a style, isn't it? It's, it's not his only style. He has many different styles. But one overall writing thing about Bob's pictures, and we'll probably see more of them, we will see more of them, is his simplicity. And I think, I think that's important because you know what the subject is and you're not confused by a lot of different elements in the scene. Anything else here? Okay, let me go down the next one. Here's another landscape, uh, Sue Baisner, and she's here tonight. And um, the, the photographers can cap, uh, comment on their own work as well. So again, this is a fairly simple scene, not a whole lot of elements in it, but what else do people notice here? There's a lot of depth to it, because you see up close on the rocks and you see the ship and the distance there. And the tonal quality I like between the rocks, the water, and the sky. And again, again, it's a it's a unified tonal quality, just like Bob's. In this case, blues and a little bit of pink, but a lot of blues. And what are those? Are those birds out there, Sue? Yes, and it, it was um, late in the day, and that it helps to explain the tonal quality. But I liked the ship leaving the picture it just made me feel like i was left behind somehow you know you find to think about where's the ship going and what are the people like inside so it it, it just created a mood for me as well and i think the monochromatic color just added to that yes yeah, so, distracting exactly so again sue mostly did this without thinking it through too deeply because she's an experienced photographer but you know, all these things we're talking about is she had to add, she had to make the camera do some things starting from what she decided to take a photograph of, the angle she took, the perspective she took, the time of day, the settings on the camera, what she chose to put in the camera. All of this stuff is added um, by them so that you can tell that the eye and the mind is seeing a particular mood, image, emotion, and story. Okay? Because Steve? Yes. It's Denise. Yes. The other thing I notice is the three objects, the stones, the ship, and the birds, allows your eye to do that sort of circular motion, moving from yes. the stones to the ship to the birds. At least that's what I'm seeing. Yes. Yes, it's easy on the eye. The eye knows where to go. It, yes. And, that, and it is, a, it is a, a serene kind of um, scene. Well, let's go on to the next one. Having, Steve, just having the one boat there. Oh, well. Go just, having the one, just having the one boat there, okay, is good. You know, it's minimalist, okay. It gives your eye a place to, to, to focus on. Yes. I would like to say that I like the curve produced by the clouds. I keep yeah. going, clouds, stone, reflection, clouds, stone, reflection. Uh, and the boat sort of anchors things uh, very nicely. Good, good. Now we'll go to the next one. I don't think Skip is with us today, but um, this is one of his pictures. Again, another landscape. It's obvious that... Um, Use of color was important here. You don't normally see this much um, color in a picture. It makes you want to look at it, doesn't it? What else? Has a certain depth to it. And I'm looking for another word. There's a, there's a lot of texture in that. Texture is the word I'm looking for, exactly. A lot of texture all throughout the picture. You have the texture of the craggy mountains. You have the all the little uh, plant life or trees, whatever they are. And and what what is emphasizing the texture in this picture? What else did he have to do to get that texture? Shadow. And how? Time. 
day. Have, time of day, exactly. The time of day allowed for those shadows to appear to make the texture deeper. These are, things, these are things that the photographer has to think about. These are part of what creates a style. And even the little bit of um, sky that shows at the top left gives a picture a sense of what size. What does anybody else think about that? Wasn't that important to leave that up there? Very unusual way of, of showing sky. <laughs> Just a little tiny piece. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Okay, wildlife. Linda, the dulacs aren't here. It's a very beautiful picture. Any comments before I say anything? Well, she's showing the bird right up front and uses the depth of field to kind of blur out everything else. That's right. And the Dulax, both of them, Linda and Norm, have said in the past that their style is not just showing the animal, but showing the animal with expression or doing something. Mm -hmm. It's not just a pretty picture of a bird. So you can you can make a story. What is this bird doing? You can you can assign an emotion, a feeling to this bird. Yes, the bird's in perfect focus. Yes, it's a beautiful picture, but it's also doing. It's also element. It's also adding something from the mind, from the eye. It's not just the camera taking a literal representational picture. Far from it. And notice one, the one of the other things that's interesting to me, if, if I may, Steve, sure. is that uh, the context of, of that bird uh, doing its behavior is so different from the behavior of every other bird that's in that image. It, it helps to make that bird stand out even more. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the contrast between it between the two. And yet, the the color in the front bird, the foreground bird is picking up the similar but darker orange in the background. And somehow that works for me. It's all a similar kind of tone there. Uh, I, would, I would add that uh, there's an awful lot of different shapes here. These yeah. shapes are all on top of each other and the, the individual uh, uh, yellow orange dots also make kind of a, a geographical sort of uh, pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it creates almost a rhythm. It's a perfect background to have the entire rest of the flock, well, to, uh, with this one bird doing a behavior. Uh, and uh, the, the beak of our central bird is right in front of a patch of plain gray so that we see very clearly right. what the behavior is. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. This is Norm. Uh, Linda's husband. I think it's kind of a, a, a similar style, isn't it? There's something going on between these two birds. Yeah, behavior. Yeah. Yeah. The behavior. So when you're going out in the field, you know, Linda and Norm, they will just sit out for an hour or more waiting in a likely spot or where there are some animals and waiting for the right expression, waiting for the moment. Finding this the moment. is entirely, um, it's, it's emotion, it's caring, it's, it's relationship between mom and chick. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's what right. really jumps out. She's grooming the chick. And so the story is, is maternal care. And, and mom watching every chick. You know, they didn't just come upon this behavior. They waited for the perfect moment. And we're going to talk about the perfect moment a little bit later. But that's so important in photography. Uh, the perfect moment isn't just an accident often. It's being where you think the perfect moment might happen and just waiting for it. It takes an experienced photographer to know that sometimes. OK, another uh, genre is street photography. Not too much of us in our club do that, do this. Um, George, this is your picture. It is. I haven't um, seen it for a while. Uh, that was a 
that was a parade um, in Chestertown. I shut the phone up. <laughs> um, so yeah, I caught these people. I well, caught the little girl going after the bubbles, and her, obviously her probably sister and friend or or whatever in the picture. But it shows action. Yes, it shows action, but it also shows the, the pure happiness of the little girl. Um, and those girls that are with her, I mean, you, you go back and forth. It looks like a candid moment, but the colors work so well together. I mean, the blues and the bubbles just work with the girls' clothing and even the little girl. It just, just pulls it together. It was a perfect moment, George, and mm -hmm. you captured it. You were there at the right moment. Those bubbles that just make the picture. The colors in the bubbles are the colors elsewhere. There's that purple of the girl's dress. There's the blue of the of bigger girls. Great picture. <sighs> Cynthia is not with us here today. For those of you who don't know, that Cynthia is about a 95-year-old <laughs> photographer. Um, this is another street shot in uh, Fountain Park. You know, a picture doesn't have to be telling a lot. But this is such a common scene that we all see. But here we've frozen that scene. When we think about it a little bit. Is she going to wait out her dog? Is she going to pull the dog back? What is she thinking? In this case, the background, even though it's busy, is not blurred out. It's in focus pretty much. It's a busy background. And yet it adds to the scene because it gives us context of, of where this person is. Anything else? It has a really a very interesting uh, contrast with the blacks and the whites and the grays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. It's looking at that. And um, the fact that that pole, they tell you in rules of composition, don't have just a little tiny bit sticking out on the edge. Either take it out or have it completely in there. But you know, um, uh, painters, artists often do this. They just put a little hint of something on the edge, especially when the uh, impressionists do that. So I think well, that's why the dog's there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly why the dog's, why the dog's there. there. You don't have to see much of it. Or it could be a you know what the dog's thinking. <laughs> yes. Uh, my Who else friends have been here. Exactly. So I, I also wonder whether she converted this to black and white to uh, keep the focus on uh, the white dog and the black top that the woman's wearing, and whether the if it were a color image, the colors in the background would have detracted from what she wanted us yeah. to look at. Yes, good point, Vic. Good I think point. so, yeah. We're going to talk about black and white more a little bit later. Uh, this is my picture. <laughs> Again, it's a busy background, but I think it's poignant. You know, the guy, they've been married a long time, and uh, the guy's completely ignoring his wife. And she doesn't give a darn anymore either. They're resigned to what their roles are in their marriage. That's how I see it. But they're both ignoring the dog. Yeah. It looks like she's asleep. Yeah, yeah she may be. Yeah. But, but you imagine there's something going on in front of them, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but it's not keeping their attention, that's for sure. No. <laughs> It's a great shot. But she's in a either a wheelchair or you know, yes. a, a, so that adds another whole dimension to. You know, he's it? he's take he's has her out for an outing. This was yeah. taken. Do some of you remember a few years ago we decided to do a Saturday at the farmers market? And I don't know if any yeah, of you were there, I but I was walking around and I got maybe yeah, I I was there. 
I, I might have gotten 20 or 30 really good pictures because there's so much going on at the farmer's market. Um, and there'll be another one you're going to see of mine later that was taken on the same day. So that's uh, my point about go where the pictures are. So it may be hard to do today, but you know, there's a lot of people milling around, a lot of stuff going on. County fair would be good. Well, enough of mine. Okay, this is not none of us. This is a more, I guess, famous person. Uh, what is it about this picture? Shapes and contrast. Yeah. Pattern, shape. Shadow. No, the smooth form. It's sensual, isn't it? Yes. Very sensual. There's not a lot in it, but it doesn't have to be. If you use the right angle towards the dunes or whatever they are uh, to get the. Um, you know, we say, yeah, and we say in a picture we want a lot of emotion, feeling, and story, but we could also, it could just be an aesthetic picture that just looks pretty. It doesn't have to be a whole lot to it. I think it looks like a people laying down, a, a nude person with a belly button. Yeah, yes. that's my first impression. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or. And chocolate pudding still cooking. I don't know. So, <laughs> oops, wrong way. Let's go. Uh, macro. This is a shot I took a long time ago. Um, who's whistling? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, A blurred background just to isolate the insect. I don't know. There's not much else to it. I'll go on. Architectural. Yes. Um, any comments on this one? Uh, beautiful. Yeah. Love the curve. Yes. Yeah. Love the curve. And this is an it works well in black and white, right? Yes, yes. it does. Well, you know, I'd like to go back to the macro shot just for a minute. It was yours. Um, what really makes this is the fact that there's all this golden light behind and around the insect and empty space, which is blue, blue yellow contrast there. Uh, so he's all warm, and then there's this cool light all around him, and that's what emphasizes him. And then the line of the leaf is sharp, but nothing else but him. Uh, so this is excellent for macro. Uh, it goes right in on something extremely tiny that we couldn't see with our eye. And the photographer here is allowing a lot of space. Um, yes. Not trying to get the bug completely in the picture, and not worrying about anything else being in the picture. It's just right. Quick. Everything else is cool blue with the warm, warm tones for the bug. But you have yeah. a clean background. Yeah. yeah. Very good. This work, you know, because you see the it, it's the tonal, uh, the different tones yeah. in the picture work well together. The similar tone in the sky and in, in, in with the building. Who did that one to you? Pardon? Who did that one? I don't know, some some well-known person. I, yeah, I, I thought I had seen I it. I found it on the internet and it didn't have the photographer's name. So mm -hmm. I guess they don't care. No architect either, dang. <laughs> this is uh, done by Ken Young. He used to come to our club. This is just to show portrait, portraiture. You know, the nice expression on the kid. Close up, clean background. Yeah, maybe his first Christmas. Who knows? Eyes are very well placed. So you just stay there, and then you twirl around to the, the, uh, the hat, and then you come back to his eyes. Nicely composed. Yeah. And you know, you don't have to try, for you beginning photographers, you don't have to try to get everything in the picture. You don't have to get the whole hat. Right. Or the whole we hands. 
you know, you see part of it. It's fine. <laughs> your face, your eyes are going to go right to his eyes in space. And you don't care about the rest of it. The hat does tell you it's it's crisp. That's enough. You don't have to see all of it. Yep. It's a hint. And you'll notice that a painter, painter artists do this a lot. They don't care about getting everything in the scene. So we shouldn't either. This is, uh, I call it abstract, you may not, but this is uh, my, my chief style is selective focus or even no focus. There's nothing in focus in this picture. And yet it works for me. Any comments? I like it. It's beautiful, Steve. So, um, again, it's not a representational picture. And it, it, doesn't... it makes me, oh, I'm sorry. It yeah. makes me feel like it's moving. You know, it's windy outside. Maybe that's why I'm thinking that way. But the, the photo has a, a feeling of movement to me. Yeah. Because it's not in focus, I suppose. Yeah. But you can tell what it is. Sure. It's not really completely abstract. It's, you know. Steve. Yes. Steve, um, yeah. going back to the flower, what I like about this is normally you see uh, objects in the front that are in focus, and then as you move to the back, it's out of focus, and you've done the exact opposite, which I think adds a lot of strength to this picture. And it's even more than the opposite because I don't think the back's really in focus. It's more in focus, you're right. And yeah. The vertical lines are pretty, you know, sort of tending towards focus, but it's not in focus. Um, somebody should mute themselves if the dog's going to keep going. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, this is uh, an example of documentary photography. I'll, I'll pause for a minute. Okay, Alfred Eisenstadt, I think most of you have heard of. Look at, um, so it, at first, you look at the two people, obviously in love. Maybe they're celebrating something. But look at all the other characters in the picture. It's almost as if it was posed. They're all looking at, obviously, they would be looking at this, these two people. I think it was the end of the Second World War. It's quite a famous. No, it's it's quite quite famous. famous. Yes. Yeah. And so it's a sailor celebrating with any woman on the street, I think, um, who's yes. about to get him back. But, is that George? No, I think it's Phyllis. I think it's Phyllis. Oh, okay. Um, there could be a lot of these similar pictures once we can get away from six feet of distancing. Yes. A lot of opportunity <laughs> for hugging. <laughs> um, <laughs> This yeah. was a, this was in the time. Maybe they have masks. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go into black and white a little bit here, because I think the, the elements of style, the elements of composition, become very obvious in black and white, and so I think it's a good example to talk about black and white a little bit. So black and white images appear to be more timeless than color images. Because black, uh, tell us, can you do something about that? Why is that? Yes, Steve, I'm sorry, I can't because we have animals that come out at night around here and they get it sets the dog off. Could you? I'm sorry, you I, I'll just get, uh, could get you off. Just mute yourself. I don't. I I don't know on this um, exactly how to do that. Okay. Um, I'll I'll just just disconnect me. Okay. Okay. I can't. I can't do it right now because I'm sharing my screen. Okay. You can. You can just mute her. I can't because um, I can't do it from sharing my screen for some reason. 
So oh. I can do it from here. I could get out of it, but I don't want to. I should just leave. Okay, so black and white images appear to be more timeless than color images. Color changes over the decades, doesn't it? Uh, but black and white's pretty much the same. Color can suggest a specific era. A lack of color in a photograph often accentuates the light in shadows. And we've seen that in some of the black and white that we just looked at. Backlit subjects and dramatic shadows are brought to the audience's attention uh, quickly. Um, I have something covering up part of my screen, so I can't read it. Uh, many fine art photographers prefer black and white images um, because they distance the subject matter from reality. And we're going to see some examples of that in a little bit. Um, humans see the world in color. And a rendition of the world in monochrome uh, ca causes us to pause and look more closely because it's not what we normally see. Removing color from the picture helps the viewer to focus on the subjects emotional state and we've seen that black and white portraiture lets the audience see the subject's face and um, read the eyes and other parts of the face without distraction in short convert images to black and white when the light form or texture in the scene is more compelling than the hues of the subject matter Black and white is a good choice when the color in a photo serves only as a distraction from the message you want the image to convey. Images with a wide range of tonal values tend to work well for black and white imagery. Most black and white images are most successful when there are definite blacks and whites. That is, the tones in the photo range all the way from the blackest black to the whitest white with lots of varying gray tones in between. So I think all of us should consider um, using black and white more um, to enhance our style, even if we're doing nature and um, flower photography. And some of us have done a little bit of that. But I think it'll help us see our subject a little bit better and in different ways to do that. Here's some examples. I guess not everyone's heard of Ansel Adams. Yeah. Um, what's distinctive about Mr. Adams' style? Anybody? Extremely sharp focus from front to back and very dark blacks and very white whites. Full tonal range. Yes, and he, had, he invented a system of tonal, of getting the, full, of the tonal range in photography. I forget what he called it, but he had a- The zone system. The zone, the zone system, yes, the zone system. So you can look at a picture and know it's his without seeing his name on it. Um, somebody else read this. I have I have something covering this. Henri Cartier-Bresson. It is by great economy that one arrives at simplicity of expression. One must always take photographs with the greatest respect for the subject and for oneself. To take photographs is to hold one's breath while all faculties converge in the face of fleeing reality. It is at that moment that mastering an image becomes a great physical and intellectual joy. To take photographs means to recognize simultaneously and within a fraction of a second both the fact itself and the rigorous organization of visually perceived forms that gives it meaning. It is putting one's head, one's eye, and one's hand on the same axis. Heart, I'm sorry, one's head, one's eye, and one's heart on the same axis. As far as I am concerned, taking photographs is a means of understanding which cannot be separated from any other means of visual expression. It's a way of shouting, of freeing oneself, not of proving or asserting one's originality. It is a way of life. And of course, he's one of the most famous photographers. Ever. Look at this picture. What is distinctive about this picture? Ocean. Well, there's movement. There's movement. There's movement. And yet it works. And, and also and there's very sharp whites and very very sharp, uh, dark darks and very white whites. 
and they're dispersed in such a way as there looks like a pattern to it. And, and one wonders how he achieves that movement without everything being out of focus or, or distorted. And I love his point of view because clearly he's up on another level looking yeah. down and it would have been so different if he had been on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. These are all elements of style, aren't they? Yep. He's, he's you, uh, coming out party of some kind. Yeah, but he's got something in mind when he takes his picture. Yeah. You know? Do we all do that most of the time? I don't know. Mary Ellen Mark, probably the most famous black and white photographer alive today. I did this three years ago. I hope she's still alive. Look at this picture. Do I have to say anything? No. Yeah, I think it's even more relevant today than it was three years ago. Yes. Absolutely. Every single face is telling a story and the, and the family, gosh, they're probably street people, right? They probably mm -hmm. lost their home. Who knows? Some tragedy. Homeless. Yeah. 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 That's the implication. Even the background plays a part. It's out of focus, but it, you can still see what it is. Amazing. The kids look like Okies, but it's hard to tell what, um, where they are, where they're going, or where they've been. But this has to be in black and white. Yeah, yeah. Richard Avedon. I mean, who would think of taking this picture? Now, what, what, what black and white really does well is take things that are odd, surrealistic, um, fantasy-like, impossible, different. That always works well in black and white. We're going to see some more of that. I don't think we would think of taking this picture. And look at the plain white background. You wouldn't think of doing that, would you? Of course, we're not Richard Avedon. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, look at this is a famous picture. Mm -hmm. He's holding. I've seen that one too. Yeah. It's got to be black and white. Look at that expression. <laughs> uh. Yeah. This is like that other one with the kids and the family. I saw that the other day. Yeah. I can't think where. Or Thea Lang. I remember reading that this was taken at the end of her photographic day. She was very tired and something told her to just stop. This was a farm, I believe, where these poor people were stayed. And she snapped this, you know, at the very end of her day, she was ready to quit. So that's that's a lesson for all of us. Sometimes it's the last one of your mm -hmm. photo session that turns out to be the one. Very good, Sue. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah, it's pretty good. Edward Weston. Mm -hmm. um, he worked in a lot of different genres. You can read that. Um, but he was a master of, of light and shape, pattern. That's a, that's a, you know, I thought that would, was some kind of uh, modern art steel structure, but it's a pepper. Yeah. Yep. Oh, wow. Cool. How do you get the light to do that? Weird shape pepper. Um, it's sensual, maybe even sexy. I mean, I couldn't do that. I don't know how to do that. I wouldn't know where to begin. But he had something in mind, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see a lot of stuff in there. This might be one of the most famous black and white photographs of life by Eugene Smith. Um, I could stare at that for a long time. Um, 
it's perfect framing. It's really dark. The foreground is is not the subject. The foreground's real dark, the background's real light, but it works perfectly. I think it's a posture of the kids as well. It's just so emblematic of kids of that age. Yeah. They're his own children. Yeah. Um, if this is an old, older photograph, would he be dodging a lot of things um, while he's developing the, the print? I don't know. Probably. I don't know. I, don't I know. think they wanted to play with dark and light. Yeah. I mean, it comes out naturally, but I just wonder if there were. I think it um, could be I think it could be natural, pretty much. Uh -huh. Yeah. I wonder if he vignetted it as well. I may have burned in on the album. I don't know. You could probably find out. But the nice thing is that it's a moment. It's a moment. He captured oh. the moment. Yes. That's a, one of the big themes here in developing a style or just taking a good fine art photograph. It's just being patient. And in a way, it shows action with him just in the mood of walking. That's right. But sometimes we just have to be patient and know where to be and wait. Look at this. Wow. Okay, black and white works really good for surrealism or fantasy. Okay, because you get rid of all the distractions and you just see the weird stuff that's going on here. I, I guess that was posed. I don't know. I can't even tell if I hope so. Our heads above the water. I have to say I guess. That takes, you know. It looks like she's not a I don't think there's many more here. Um, again, this is the same subgenre of the other one. It's abstract, surrealistic, weird. Works well in black and white. I'm not going to stay here too long. How about this one? Gary Winograd. The right mm -hmm. moment. He's even got a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? Look at the expression on the people. Street, street performance, it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Look at the people on the right looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> You're not afraid. I think he's a tram. Is that a trampoline? You see that one um, metal bar? Oh, right? Might be, yeah. Good point. Yes. Maybe. It does look like well, a trampoline. The guy, on, the people on the right, the way they're dressed, it looks like they could be uh, troop performers, right? Part right. The, At least there's the balloons way. on the left, so it looks like there's some kind of fair or something going on. But see, there's only the people a on the right are very much part of the moment. <laughs> you have to look at the picture for a while to pick up these little details. Isn't that interesting? You don't see it the first three seconds. Mm -hmm. You're just looking at the guy, but then you look around and you see some other stuff going on, and you can kind of figure out what the picture's about. That's interesting. He's certainly not falling because the people don't look horrified. Well, he doesn't look like he's upset either. No, no, exactly not. And when the picture not a, looks like he's falling. That's not that a normal. normal. He, he actually, he actually is upset. <laughs> he's upset down. <laughs> yeah, upset down. Very, very I wonder, good. I, I wonder whether this is this is a float that's moving along a parade route, and you know, these are performers on the float. It does look like that with a trampoline on it? Yeah. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> It's an interesting thought. So, so to summarize here, when you're out of doors, notice the way the light falls on your subjects. Um, <coughs> figure out, it, would it be better to do this earlier or later in the day? Um, the more that you observe the light and other aspects of, of, of everyday life when you're not looking through the lens, you know, do that, practice that. You don't have to have your camera to see a picture. You can come back later and pull out your camera and take that picture. But be considering 
Oh, that looks like a good, and I'm sure you've all done that. That looks like a good picture. How can I make this picture into my style? How can I take it my unique way? I'll come back later. Okay, I'm gonna do some, some a little experiment here and do some style comparisons. Um, by the way, that's mine on the left and Bob Miller's on the right. Okay, this is a picture I took, remember I said I was at the uh, farmer's market. And I took a picture of this gentleman. He's an old time Chestertown guy. Um, you well, know, it's a pretty decent picture. You wonder what he's thinking about. He's in some kind of mind space here. But look what I did to it to make it my style. Now, I, I put a different background in it, but what else did I do? What did I do by putting this background in there? Can anybody hear me? We yeah. Are. Uh, yeah. 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 What do you notice? What's the difference? There's something really weird about this picture. Better there. <laughs> huh? Well, you make one, the, the moment the clouds looks like it's a fantasy. It looks like he's floating yes. in air. Yes, there's yeah, no. Levitating. Yeah, there's no, um, what do you call it? Um, he took this setting away. There's no horizon. There's no horizon here, is there? And right. not, in That's other words, context. he's in the clouds, literally. Yeah. So the expression on his face is he's in the clouds, and literally the picture's in the clouds. And your dove and rainbow work well with that too on the bench. Yeah, yeah exactly. So this is, this is a way that I made this into a style, or my style. Okay. Um, this is um, part of uh, my close-up style, uh, uh, selective focus, and I want to compare that to Bob Miller's picture where everything in the foreground, everything's in focus, and the drops even accentuate the very sharp focus of this flower. Now, the background is dark. It's not even important in this picture, except to, sh to, um, to accentuate the flower. In mine, the background is very much part of the picture. Not one is better than the other. And, and Bob will do pictures like I do them, and I'll do them like Bob. But I like doing selective focus pictures with blurry backgrounds. Now, his is out of focus, but it's not really blurry. But his is sharp and mine is my mine emphasizes a lot of blur. Just an interesting comparison of styles. Any comments? Okay, I'll go on to the next one. Again, out of focus tulips. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's anything sharp in this picture. Something I like to do. And here's Bob's tulip. It's all sharp. Not one is better than the other. They're two different pictures and they represent two different styles. Um, this is a focus stack picture of mine. Uh, it's kind of dreamy, I guess. Again, a lot of out of focus elements. And here's Bob with a completely different picture. Everything's in focus. It's still the same kind of green. It's a completely different picture. It's a wonderful picture. Yeah, the cover. Different styles. This is again mine. Exaggerated light. And this is this is this is uh, hot. And this is cool. He could have done the same thing if he wanted to. He could have made the yellow stamens uh, overexposed and hot if he wanted. But this is his style, and this works really great. Everything's in sharp focus, set off against a, a, a po uh, opposite background. 
my background is just kind of diffused from the foreground. It's not a whole lot different. Two different complete styles. The only thing in common is the close-up flowers. This is one of my uh, candy apple tulips. Very sharp. Maybe that's a close-up of that. I don't know. Similar. Mm -hmm. Similar flower. Same flower. All of it sharp and beautiful. This is a columbine. That's a columbine. Yeah. Okay. Now we need some interactivity here. This is Sue's picture. What What's the style here? Is there a style? Mm. What has she done to make this hurt? What? I'll tell you what I see. She stayed here. on the outside of the fence. Yes, the fence. The fence is important to me in this picture. You know, I'd like to be up and, and walking up to that house and be in that yard and go into the foggy background, but I can't. I'm stopped by the fence, so I observe it from afar. And it's a little bit uh, foggy or misty. I, 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 I don't have access to that scene for, because of the fence, because of the fog. It's all being separated from me. But I want to be there. It has, uh, it has an, art, an, an artistic style because of the fog, okay, creating yes. that artistic. Yes. This is what this would be in the style of uh, um, I can't think of his name An Andrew Wyeth maybe I don't know. Mm. It would be very sharp if it was Andrew Wyeth. Yeah. No, not all of his stuff. Linda Dulac. Again, they're not just birds. They're doing something. They're ex they have an expression. You can imagine what's going on between these birds. A very simple background. Yeah, well, the style is behavioral. It's got a wonderful- well, to capture moments. It's got a wonderful tone to it. It looks like a pattern on a kimono, you know, with the uh, activity of the, the birds and then the beautiful cherry blossoms on the blue. It looks like a piece of kimono cloth. Again, the dual acts have to be very patient to get these shots. Bill, black and white. Oh, wow. There it is. What does black and white do for this picture, people? Before Bill, other people. Moody. Mysterious. Yeah. Lonely. Shows the, shows the values also. Mm -hmm. Why black and white? Creates a mood. Yeah. Shows up the water nicely. Yeah. It's just very lonely road. Bill, do you have anything to add? No, it, uh, but it is moody, isn't it? Yes. It, it captures the mood of, uh, in a way that captures the mood of our, uh, our times. Yes. Right. Yeah. And the empty road, nobody's there. There's nothing. Yeah, bring some sunshine. <laughs> It's a style, Bill. You have a style. <laughs> and I, I notice your pictures on the water um, and your misty scenes on the water are similar to this. So that is a style of yours, not your only style, but you do mm. this a lot. Okay, so you have a very definite style. Norm, again. Mm -hmm. Why yep. not? He's not afraid to leave some of the birds not not out in the open. You see, you know, there's at least four birds there, all with their mouths open. 
It's a busy scene, but it still works, doesn't it? Because that yellow just, that's where your eye's gonna go. You're not gonna worry about the overly busy scene with those, those yellow mouths open like that. Your eye's gonna go right there. Phyllis, is Phyllis still with us? Yes. I, oh, good, I'm glad you're here. Uh, yeah. Minimalism. Anybody else? It's an everyday thing. It's not a special object. It's just a plain old tree, but look where it is. and It's all alone. And you normally probably wouldn't notice it, but phot photographically, she captured something the eye would normally not go to look at, just like those sheets on the bed that I showed much earlier. I think it also obeys the composition rules. Yep. And the sky, if it were a bland gray or, uh, you know, blue sky without, an, without any clouds, I, I don't think it would have the character that it has. That's right. That just helps draw your eye. Yeah. I like that word, too, character. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that's very intriguing about this is if you look very closely at the bunch of trees there, there is an old dilapidated house inside there. Oh, this yeah. is the remnants of a farm. This was the farmhouse that was in this area. Wow. Um, it is kind of, I, must, I haven't been up into it because, but I, I think it must have stones of some sort. There are markers um, because it looks like just a cluster of bushes, but you have to get closer and closer to see what it is. The interesting thing to me is the history that goes into it. Um, I don't know that much about it. I don't have any oral history with anyone who maybe whose family had the farm and kept it for generations, but it was a slave um, cemetery. That, that's the only thing I've heard about. Slave cemetery? Slave cemetery. Slave, uh, slave cemetery. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that dates it back, you know, at least to the, to the wow. mid um, 1800s. Oh, yeah. Well, and now, it's now it's all overgrown like that. Okay, that's yeah. that's pretty pretty. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that's tempting to do an oral history with somebody who, who, whose family maybe had roots in this area of farming uh, that dates back a century, you know, something like that. Let me go to on. find out a little bit more about it. Let me go on. Oh, uh, where was it? I beg your pardon. Where was that? Uh, well, if you see uh, Crumpton Bridge, you just uh, go maybe about 300 yards and you could look to your right if you're coming across the bridge. Um, and you'll see it over there. In the Close top. to your house then. Yeah. yeah, it's not far from us, no. Which direction, coming to, into Queen Anne's or into Kent? Uh, going into Kent. If you're on 290, going into Kent in the direction of 291. Got it, yeah. I go there. Well, I, I used to go there with the barn a lot. Let's get to the next picture now. Yes. Uh, Bill, this is a wonderful landscape. What do people see in this as far as style? Composition. Rules, yes. So you have converging elements. Um, Huge depth. Symmetry. Reflection, symmetry. The reflections, and it was an overcast day that day, and it was able to just bring it all, all out, and it just looks like it goes to infinity there. Yeah, focus in the that, front and back. Symmetrical, uh, east, east, west, and north, south. Yes. Beautiful. Just beautiful. It's a beautiful picture, Bill. Oh, yeah. Be proud of this. It uh, brings the word majesty to my mind. But Bill had to search out a specific scene. It wasn't random landscape. And he photographed it from the exact right point to exaggerate the symmetry. Um, so he had things in mind um, to make this picture his own, his own style. I like this, the hole in the sky, top and bottom of the reflection. That really balances it out. And then the, the, uh, 
the uh, tree lines on both sides. It's very, very interesting picture, a very good picture. And the exposure is just perfect. I don't know how you've managed to do it. Well, that was just, handheld, and I was standing on a curved bank. Wonderful, just perfect, beautiful. Again, Skip is not here, but he caught the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and after two seconds, you notice the boat's upside down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a Dawn Miller. Um, ah. Um, what's the style here, people? Simplicity. Minimalist. Yeah, I was saying Minimalist. simplicity. Yeah. It's kind of high key a little bit, right? Simplicity. You normally wouldn't see this. That You wouldn't, your eye had to search this out. This is not a literal picture a camera would normally take. You had to figure out how to take this picture to get this look. And Dawn, this is one of Dawn's styles because she often does this kind of thing. I don't know what to call the style, mm -hmm. but it, it's slight things, um, um, gracious, um, delicate, I would say, high key, in a way, symmetrical. She does a lot of this kind of work. So this is one of Dawn's styles, not her only style. You don't have Just to playing have, with light. Yeah, you don't have to have one. The style. use of light. There's no sense of where this is, and that's okay. It's kind of abstract in a way. Yeah. Very good. That's very good feedback. You showed this last week. Lewis couldn't be here because he had to go um, to another Zoom meeting with an accomplished photographer. Um, but like some of the black and whites we saw with the expressions on the people's faces, I think this approaches that. It's not just a snapshot, is it? Even the background shows, it, you know, probably not a ritzy place that these people are at. Expressions are similar on both faces. The color. The faces are so clear and then the colors accent them. There's kind of um, juxtaposition here. Does anybody see it? The, the bright colors with the nature of their expressions are kind of opposite, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Caroline, are you still with us? Yes. Yes. Okay, this you might see this is still, kind of, um, Yeah, this is a Sudlersville um, take, uh, I said take in. But, you know, you might not think much of the picture, but when you notice she's wearing a mask, all the meaning comes into the picture. Yeah. But, what is she thinking? Just nobody's there and she's just waiting. So you wonder. Photojournalistic. This is one of my COVID shots. And there could have been no cars there at the moment because normally they were busy scurrying around helping people and people were helping themselves. Well, she's just standing waiting for some cars to come. Well, she's a teacher. She would be a teacher. There's a point to this picture. It tells a story. And your style here is to tell a story. Is Rodney here today? No. Rodney. There's uh, lots of light and dark and pattern, repeating pattern. I don't think Rodney cares what this picture's about. It just looks pretty. It was just uh, on the moment, the spur of the moment, because yeah, it looked good. Yeah. And that's what it's about. And that's the style. It looks good. Okay. That's the presentation.
Round up. Peace. Thank you.